know. Well, welcome everyone um, on a Tuesday evening um, to hear from Dr. Donnie Watson and Dr. Mo Gelbar on all things opioid and fentanyl addiction, um, something that is kind of plaguing our society right now, especially with our young folks. So um, with, without further ado, doctors, take it away. Oh, are we ready to start? Well, good. Hello, everybody. Good evening. Thanks for coming out. Uh, I'm just going to mess my camera up one moment here. So, as I say, thank you for coming. I'm going to uh, share my screen here. Dr. Watson, is that visible? Yes. Okay. So, we're here to talk about a really, obviously, important topic and one that is uh, prominent in the news. Let me start with, uh, I'm Dr. Mo Gelbart. I'm the director of behavioral health at Torrance Memorial Medical Center, and I'm the executive director of the Phil McMillan Recovery Center at Torrance Memorial Hospital as well. And Dr. Donnie Watson's with us, and I will be uh, splitting this talk. I'll do the first half, and I'll explain what our outline is in just a moment. And Dr. Watson is the program director of the Phil McMillan Center. So <clears throat> what we're going to talk about is the fentanyl crisis. Uh, again, been in the news for months. Over 100,000 people have died of drug overdoses in 2021, and two thirds of those have involved fentanyl. And to put that into perspective, to make kind of give numbers and statistics sort of a, a little bit of life, you know, think about a, a, a jumbo airliner going down every day and everybody on it dying. That's what that looks like. And, uh, you know, we really need to understand that and think as a, as a society what, what to do. You know, most of the users, and much of what I'm speaking about right now, Dr. Watson is gonna cover in a little more detail in a moment, but most users are unaware that they're even taking fentanyl. And only two grams are considered lethal, uh, which as you'll see in a moment is the tiniest speck of, of, of drug. And it's particularly dangerous for someone who doesn't have tolerance for opioids. Uh, as the uh, says, drug traffickers are driving addiction and increasing their profits by mixing fentanyl with other illicit drugs. Tragically, many overdose victims have no idea that they're ingesting deadly fentanyl until it's too late. And even scarier recently, some of you may have seen, we, we're hearing about rainbow fentanyl, which is being marketed as crazy as it sounds to little kids or to middle school kids. And again, just in the news last week, I think there were eight or nine middle schoolers somewhere in, I believe, the valley that were hospitalized for a uh, potential overdose of, of fentanyl. So again, a huge crisis. Again, as I said, Dr. Watson's gonna cover some of this in more detail. I'm what we're gonna do today is the following. I'm gonna talk a little bit about brain development in general and what brain development means for drug and alcohol use, particularly among teens. Talk a little bit about why teens use at all, why teens use drugs, alcohol, and then Dr. Watson will uh, go into opioids and fentanyl use in particular. We'll talk about some signs and symptoms of use and then some suggestions for all of you out there. <clears throat> so newsflash, teen brain is not ready for adulthood. You know, we used to think that it, the brain was developed within the first five years of one's life. What we now know is that the brain takes about 24 to 25 years to fully ma mature and develop. Uh, the maturation process, I say, is not complete until about age 24. And it has a certain procedure that the brain develops around. Uh, this, these are some scans of brains and the blue is the development, but as you see on top, it says age five to 20. And <clears throat> the brain develops from the back of the head to the front and the frontal cortex is the prefrontal cortex is the last part to develop. And why is that important? Well, because different parts of the brain ha have to do with different functions uh, th that people have. And if we take a look at this, pruning occurs, I say, from the back to the front. And the first part of the brain that is developed is the cere cerebellum, which helps develop physical coordination and sensory processing. That allows kids, teens to start 
when young kids to start feeling their bodies in the world, to feel their limbs, their arms, they begin to get coordination and they start just having a sense of who they are in this world. Then the nucleus accumbens begins to develop, another part of the brain, which has to do with motivation and desire. And, uh, you know, again, now we have somebody who's physical, physically capable, and has some motivation, desire to do things. The brain continues to develop, and we have the amygdala, which is the seat of emotions. So now you have a teenager who has physical coordination, motivation, and desire, and emotions. And if we had, a, we were sitting in a room, I'd ask you this question, but I'll ask it and then answer it myself. What's missing? What's the last part to, to uh, develop? What's missing is the prefrontal cortex, which is judgment. So we have this, that's why we have these teens doing often what look like crazy things to adults, you know, jumping off cliffs on little bikes and, and having the greatest old time as they have uh, you know, their, their, their bodies are aching to express themselves and so on, yet they may not have the judgment that's required. And as I said, it's not until about 24, 25, when it all sort of evens out and it's all developed. It's kind of interesting. I don't think it's by design, but the car manufacturers probably have it right. You know, you can't rent a car until you're 25 years old. And uh, given this brain development and how as again, judgment doesn't come into play until later in, in, in the early 20s. It makes sense that that would be the case. Uh, now, on top of that, think about what happens if you begin to sprinkle drug and alcohol use into that developing brain. It, it impairs that development. It stunts that development often, again, depending on how much usage there is. Uh, and again, because the judgment's not there, kids often don't know what choices to make and what good choices to make. So can addiction or even use be, can, addic can, can di addiction and difficulty in use be prevented by delaying drug use onset? So every year use of a substance is delayed, the risk of developing a substance use disorder is reduced. You know, what we say in Thelma, it's, it's you know, we, we get a lot of kids and most of the kids we see are not addicted to drugs. Most of the kids are having problems or are, doing a little more than just experimenting, but uh, they're experiencing negative consequences as I'll explain in a moment. Uh, but every year that, that they don't use is a, a better guarantee that they won't have a problem. You know, we, we, the, the saying that we sometimes say is we wanna keep them alive till they're 25, because again, back to brain development, at that stage in their life, they'll begin to make better choices. And here's an example, just looking at alcohol, of what happens if you delay alcohol use. On the left here, if, if alcohol use begins before the age of 12, there's a 16% chance that that person will become addicted to alcohol, become dependent on alcohol. If they wait until they're 12 to 14, it goes down to 15%, 15 to 17 years old, 9% and so on. If they wait until they're over 21, which is the legal age for drinking, their uh, probability for having a substance abuse or an alcohol abuse problem really goes all the way down to 2.6. And that's again, based on this brain development. And again, another reason why it's so important to try to have uh, our young people not experiment and not use. Uh, so as I said, most of the people that we see, for example, at Thelma, most kids are not addicted to drugs. They don't, be, but they experiment they use and they abuse substances. And although addiction may not be a the most significant problem, it is significant if you're one of those people that have the, has the addiction, there's what we call unintended negative consequences. And there are things that happen when kids start using. Their grades are poor. This is something that can follow them throughout life because of poor grades and in high school, they may not get into the college that they want to get into, and you know that begins to affect their whole career. They run into legal problems, and some legal problems also affect college. For example, uh, if you have a uh, legal history, you may not be able to get a student loan. There's uh, sexually transmitted disease and pregnancy and health problems that are unintended negative consequences. Kids get arrested. And then finally is accidents and two kinds of accidents. The one we're going to really focus on tonight, 
which is accidents of overdose and so on. And then there's accidents that uh, occur while somebody is driving under the influence, driving a boat under the influence or something else that they do that causes either themselves or others harm. Now this may sound like, you know, disaster and, and catastrophizing, but I can tell you, you know, I've been, in, I've been in practice here in the South Bay for 45 years. We've run the Thelma McMillan Center for over 30 years. And I've worked with quite a number of families and kids who have had serious uh, issues and, and wind up quite honestly in, in jail and prison as a result of uh, drug and alcohol use. And they are not, they were not addicted. They were experimenting. So it's really important to teach our kids the danger of this, but also not, how not to get in, involved. So why do kids use? So the answer is complex. No easy answer. Genetics, if there's a family history of, of alcohol or drug use, they're going to be pre-wired to having uh, a drug and alcohol problem. Uh, they wanna be accepted by their peers. A big portion is self-medicating for things like depression and anxiety and ADD and ADHD. They wanna escape. They don't wanna feel what they're feeling and they may not be doing well. So drugs provide them a, a temporary relief. Uh, Another way of looking at adolescence is a time for trying new things. Using as a teen increases the risk of using other drugs later. And a teen may abuse drugs for many reasons, including curiosity, bullying, escaping anxiety, excitement, it feels good, relief from low self-esteem, reduce stress, lose weight, feel grown up and fit in, and everybody's doing it. You know, I like, I don't like, but this notion of everybody's doing it, and this will be part of the parental strategies later. You know, one of the things many of your children will say to you is, but when it comes to drinking or smoking pot or whatever, well, everybody's doing it. That has two parts to that, that statement. One, a lot of kids do experiment. Two, everybody doesn't. And one of the things we try to study and research is what are the factors, the pre preventative and protective factors in those kids that choose not to use? Some other reasons why kids use. They experiment, as I said, modify unpleasant feelings. Drugs are available. In some school districts, it's easier to get uh, drugs, alcohol, than it is sometimes to get books. Uh, it works every time when you take, the, at least in the beginning. And it has this dopamine release. Dopamine is a neurotransmitter which provides pleasure in the brain. And, and I have on here brain hijack. Once you start using drugs as a young teen, and your brain gets that feeling of dopamine release, then the things which bring it normal dopamine release, the things which are normally pleasurable, have such less effect that you begin to ignore those and want to get that same high that you get from the drugs. And then there's FOMO, fear of missing out. So those are the some others, lack of parental support and guidance, uh, excessive pressure to, to succeed and excel. What I mean by lack of parental support and guidance, you know, as parents, we're always we're very busy with our, with with our careers, with our lives, with multiple kids, and as long as the it looks like things are okay, sometimes we're not looking under the covers deep enough, and that's one of the things we're going to talk about a little bit later. Uh, excessive pressure to succeed and excel is another uh, reason kids may turn to drugs and alcohol. Family turmoil, like you know, arguing and fighting at home, and the inability to communicate and talk and share. So with that, I'm gonna turn this over to Dr. Watson, who will dive into the fentanyl issue in particular. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for giving me the opportunity to share some thoughts on, uh, on, on, on this menace. I call it the menace because it's really such a dangerous, and Dr. Gilbert has talked about, if we had 300 people die every day from in a plane crash, I can guarantee you that the, the government, the citizens, we would figure out a way to make those planes safer. So uh, without further ado, uh, next slide. So what is it? It's a very powerful synthetic opioid like morphine. One of the things I did want to touch on as you know, with the oxycodone uh, overprescriptions and people uh, overdosing and dying from those prescription drugs, what happened is doctors were less likely to, to write those scripts. So the unintended consequence of that is that these um, 
uh, illegal substances start, start to, to, to flourish. And one thing I want to say, so I don't forget to say it, uh, an oxy uh, pill made $10, $20. You can get a fentanyl counterfeit pill for like five cents, pennies on the dollar. So it's very, it's, 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 it's very uh, accessible in that way. It's 50 to 100 times more, more potent than, than morphine. Now, it does have a medical use to treat severe pain. There's legal forms and active in different names, a sublimase. But the illegal form is made in, in labs by drug uh, cartels uh, out, of, out of China and out of Mexico predominantly. And this is the thing about fentanyl that is so frightening and scary. You can put it in any substance. It can be a powder and, and it, you know, uh, put in eye drops, nasal sprays, and it mixes very well. So we talk about uh, sometimes it was spiked with spiked with, uh, with with fentanyl. Now you have the counterfeit pills. Next slide. Exactly. So here's some of the fentanyl effects: euphoria, drowsiness, extreme happiness. If you talk to someone, and where I get a unfortunately get an opportunity to talk to folks, teens and adults, they have such a feeling of well-being, it's such an escape, that dopamine release and, and that, that uh, momentary uh, sense of well-being uh, is what people seek. However, the other side of it, nausea, confusion, sedation, constipation. So the signs of overdose. So uh, uh, fentanyl is, is, is a little different. So these are kind of the general things, small pupil, slow breathing, respiratory failure, unconsciousness, coma. But what's unique to fentanyl is immediate blue lips, mouth foaming, the body stiffens, uh, seizures. And part of it, because it's so powerful, these symptoms occur overall much quicker. In fact, when they have, uh, uh, for you, those of you who are pet owners, and I imagine a lot of you are, there have been cases where the drug dogs, they've had, they've had overdoses and died because they go in sniffing to, to uh, to detect these drugs and just like humans a little bit will and so now their handlers now have a, a device where they can administer narcan and naloxone to to bring their animals back because it's that serious and that's why when you see them going in to do these drug raids sometimes they have full body gear it's just that that dangerous this drug a speck of it um i, I saw there was a state trooper who stopped somebody uh, they had something in the car it was a white powder he said well let me take a look at it you know, kind of put his finger and he was driving along and about and literally like a couple minutes later, he, he just he he collapsed behind the wheel because it was fentanyl it was a substance and he wasn't aware of that's what it was. Uh, next slide, please. So how and why cartels? It's about the money. Show me the money. Straight cash is business. That's that's what it's that's what it's about for the drug cartels. And they're not necessarily trying to kill folks, but if that's the, the price of doing business, that's the price of doing business. Because in these labs, they have these very uh, 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 precise uh, uh, machines that, that, that slice off enough of the, of the particular drug where every once in a while, like once out of every you know thousand slices, they may get a, a little bit more of a chunk than intended. And that little bit more is what uh, uh, oftentimes will lead to overdose and, and, and death. They're not trying to kill folks, but they don't care if you die as a price of business. Uh, and this is the other really dangerous part of, of, of it's, it's laced in other street drugs. And what kids don't know, they may think they're buying Oxy or, or, or Zanny, uh, Xanax, Xanax on the street, but in fact, it either might be laced with fentanyl or or it's, it's completely fentanyl. And so we've also seen a rise in cocaine and meth overdoses. And those drugs historically did not cause a lot of overdoses. I mean, they're stimulants. But what happens again, in order to make profit, the, 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 the cartels and the drug dealers would put, will uh, put uh, fentanyl and, and, and the heroin, the cocaine, the meth, I mean, and, the, and the cocaine and the meth or Adderall and you think you're taking that drug, but you're taking something much more powerful and you end up dead. Uh, so 
Doc, uh, Dr. Gilbert showed you the cute little tablets and pills. That's all intended to attract the next generation of, uh, of user. And as I said, it's pennies, uh, pennies on the dollar. You can get it so cheap. And there's there are places like the, the, the dark web and there's another website that I won't give out where people can go and purchase these. They can deliver it to your house. Uh, they can buy it online and it's just it's a bit, very, very dangerous. And um, as I mentioned, folks think they might be buying uh, Xanax, but in fact, they're buying uh, fentanyl. Next slide. And so it's now the number one cause of death for, for folks age 18, people age 18 to 45. It's the number one. And Dr. Gilbert went over some of the stats, 100,000 died between April 20 and April 21. Fatalities are up by 50% in 12 months. Now, teen death is up by almost 95%. And that gets to the point that folks who are dying from this, they're not your traditional drug addicts or people who are addicted to substances. We've had some cases in the, in, in the South Bay of, of some 14, 15 year olds who uh, thought they were taking Xanax. They were taking, it turned out that the, the drug screen turned out that it was an uh, autopsy. It turns out it was actually fentanyl that they did not know. So there's a real misconception that overdoses mm -hmm. is only with those who are addicted to substances. So there's even a move in the field to change the word from overdose to, to, to poisonous. Because if you're taking something that, that's, because there's a stigma uh, attached to overdose in some ways, like, well, they were, they were quote, an addict and da, da, da. But that's not, that's not the case. The DA reports that 40% of the counterfeit pills are deadly. So it, it's, it's truly a game of Russian roulette. And then you have uh, car fentanyl, which is the fentanyl analog pills, 10 times quicker than fentanyl. So what's, what, what could you possibly use car fentanyl for? Well, in veterinary medicine, it's used to tranquilize elephants. <laughs> so you're gonna bring an elephant, slowly bring an elephant to its knees and knock an elephant out so they can do surgeries and yet imagine what it could do to a human being. Next slide, please. And you know, the fentanyl death is is a terrible way to die. It's 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 a it's a form of suffocation. I mean, your 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 brain, you literally forget how to breathe something you've done all your life, but you become so sedated and your systems are, are, are so depressed that you literally forget how to breathe. A death can occur within minutes or, or seconds. Uh, sometimes referred to as a wooden box because that's what it, it feels like your chest is, is, is caving in on you. Someone dies from this every nine minutes. So from the time that we've had this presentation and we started right See what kind of math I have. We started right at six o'clock. So at least uh, the two folks have probably died. And in about three minutes, another person will have died. So by the time my presentation ends, um, three folks would have, would have died from, from fentanyl death. Uh, Colorado experienced a 1,008% increase since 2015. And, I, and I, this is, I think it's time that we do away with this whole idea that teen experimentation is just a phase. You know, a lot of times, and this is what I hear from parents. Well, I did it when I was a uh, uh, when I was a kid, when I, and I don't care about that. And I tell parents, <laughs> I don't care what you did and the mistakes that you made when you were fourteen or fifteen. And parents all say, "Well, you know, I want to I want to be honest with my 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 kids. I don't want to be a hypocrite." Well, when you tell them that you did something at fourteen, when you made some bad choices at 14 or 15, they look at you and you're successful. They, it doesn't really serve as a warning to them in the way that you think it might. What it does is a green light to them that, oh, I can do it too because my mom and my dad did it. And so again, we get to this question, parents say, well, I don't want to be a liar or hypocrite. Well, your 14 or 15 year old doesn't really need to know what you did at 14 or 15. And that's, if that's not on the table. So well, we can talk about me some other time, but what I'm trying to do is keep you safe. Whatever you can do, whatever you have to do to keep your kids safe from this, you have to hold on to these kids. Because I reiterate, it's not just folks who are really into the whole drug scene or addicted to these substances. It's that everyday kid who just at a party decides to do something 
that there's no coming back from. Next slide. So this is probably the most powerful slide I can show you. If if you look at the, what what a lethal dose might be, and you have a dime, just look at that for ten seconds. So that's as much as it will that it could take to kill you, particularly if you're someone who's opioid naive. Your system is not used to it. That's all it takes. That's all it takes. Uh, next slide, please. So Narcan, this is the one thing that I have it in my car, I have it in my office, because this is a drug, naloxone, that can quickly reduce, uh, reverse an overdose. Uh, and I've, you know, I saw this documentary in, in, in parts of Ohio and West Virginia, where this one guy, he was in his 20s, he overdosed like two or three times in the same day. And he got, <laughs> took him to the hospital, he came back out, overdosed again. In most cases, if you're lucky, you can be re revived in minutes. But sometimes there are other drugs other than, than, than fentanyl in it, and you may, it may not uh, revive you. It, it's, you may need more than one dose. So one of the things that I would encourage everyone who's listening tonight is, and you can purchase it in, at CV, uh, CVS. Uh, most schools have it for free now. Unfortunately, it's kind of part of our, our, our landscape. Easy to use, it comes in two forms, nasal spray and then an auto injector for the thigh. Um, next slide. How to save a life. Call 911 immediately. Try to wake the person, shake the person up. One message I, I, I give to teens in, in, in particular, because sometimes they're afraid they're gonna get in trouble. So they may do be doing a substance with a, with a bunch of their friends and they will leave that person and say, look, we're not gonna be upset with you for saving a life. They think they're getting in trouble. So if you do something, make a bad, a bad decision, let's not compound that bad decision. Don't ever leave anyone who is, has gotten sedated from whatever, because they may think they're just smoking. This is the other thing I'm, I must say. So the street weed and gummies, they're also being, being uh, spiked with, with fentanyl. So he may say, well, I'm just smoking weed. Well, you may think that's what you're smoking. It could be something else. Uh, you begin rescue breathing or CPR. You turn the person on the side to prevent choking. You stay with the person until emergency help uh, arrives. Next slide. Okay. Challenges, opportunities. It's easy to obtain. Pennies on the dollars I mentioned. Sold on e-commerce, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, e-commerce, and social media. Prices penny on the dollars. Uh, on the dollar, teens and others, nothing. This will happen to them. Even as adults, when you're driving, which I don't do this. When you're late for a flight going to LAX and you're going 80 miles an hour, 85 miles an hour, you're not thinking I'm going to get pulled over. You're not thinking I'm going to get ejected to that. That I'm going to have an accident. No one thinks it's going to happen to them. We don't think that way. We don't think it's going to happen to us. The, the ways, even I, I think about how teen. Tobacco smoking went down, and it went down because it was a full-on public health media campaign. Uh, media campaign, and all of a sudden, teens didn't think it was cool anymore to to, to smoke, and, and we saw those numbers really de decrease. You know, I think we need teen ambassadors. Adults can talk about it, but teens are more likely to feel more connected if some of their because we spend a lot of time, uh, and rightly so, for, for youngsters who have substance use issues. But there's another group of youngsters who don't. So teen comes in and says, well, everybody I know use it. I said, well, the people you, you hang around with do. There is a population of folks that don't. So I talk about the public health model, which is like what, what happened in this country that helped reduce teen uh, tobacco smoking and adult smoking. It was a full on um, coordinated approach. So uh, that's my, my part of the presentation. Thank you so much for your attention for this most, uh, most important topic. So I'll turn it back over to Dr. Gilbert. Right. So I'm, I'm running uh, low on time. I'm going to run through some uh, signs and symptoms of drug and alcohol use in general. And why, you know, even though this is focused on fentanyl and, and opioid use, you know, uh, most 
most <clears throat> drugs are gateways to, to eventually more drugs. So it's important to know if your child is using it all. And again, I'm gonna have to run through this a little bit quickly so we can save some time for Q&A. But physical evidence, meaning things are lying around, pipes lying around, stashes, uh, you know, if you, if, if you find marijuana in your child's bedroom and in, in their knapsack, what's the first thing they're always gonna say? Again, if we had an audience here, they'd say, Dr. Watson, what would they say? I said, it's Dr. Gilbert, it's not mine. It's not mine, it's not, not mine. Me. They're always gonna say it's not theirs. And then when you find it the second time, or you- It's still not mine. Say, oh my God, I can't believe it. The second time I ever had it in my life and you found the second time. So we have to pay attention to those, to what we see with our eyes. If your child has a concern for privacy starts being, you know, a lot of this, you know, the overall umbrella is if there's significant changes going on. If they start using mouthwash or gum, ways to get away with the, uh, with the, uh, you know, odor and smell. Uh, I tell, you know, if they come home late at night, oftentimes if your child is drinking or using, they're going to run, want to run upstairs. What I like to tell parents to do is say, when they come home, give them a hug, give them a little hug and hug them nice and close to their face. They don't want to do it because that's easy for you to smell alcohol or marijuana on them. Uh, again, unfamiliar smell on clothing, use of eye drops. If your alcohol is disappearing from home, pay attention. Uh, this one seems strange, not strange, seems, seems, I, I run a parent, I run a parent chat group and this topic comes up a lot on both sides. One, what if parents are telling you, hey, you know, I want you to know your child is using. You know what happens a lot that turns into a fight and an argument. Or the other thing which happens much more often is parents say, I know Johnny's using, should I call his parents or not? And just think about if you know, if you, with your child, if you would wanna know that or not. Most people wanna know. Uh, again, a few more, their peer relations are changing, their friends are different. They don't tell you too much about where they are. Uh, they suddenly, if they have a new status with peers, they're suddenly, uh, you know, again, are, are, are seen with much more, uh, uh, as I say, status, why would that be? Well, you know, maybe they're involved in dealing drugs or getting it or procuring it for their friends. Behavioral changes, their appearance changes, they withdraw, they're depressed, they're uh, anxious, they lie more, lack of cooperation, friction in the family, make up their own rules. Again, by the way, lots of this can be signs of things other than drug or alcohol use, but these are, it's important to just, just as important to pay attention if there's signs of, of depression or, or anxiety, but uh, again, it may be drug, drug and alcohol use. Curiosity about drug and alcohol. If they're talking about drug use, if you go into your child's room and they have marijuana posters and they're listening to music that glorifies drugs and alcohol, you wanna have a talk with them. You don't wanna just ignore them. You know what a lot of parents sometimes do is they look at results. My child is doing well in school. Therefore, either he, he or she couldn't have a problem. My child is doing great on their athletic team. Therefore, they can't have a problem. The reality is their grades and their, and their athletic abilities and their uh, extracurricular activity abilities will go down eventually. But those are not in and of themselves reasons to think everything is fine and okay. Uh, and academic performance, obviously. If their grades are slipping, if they're not doing their work, they have trouble concentrating. Uh, these are all the various signs and symptoms of drug use in general. And if you can uh, observe it and, and begin working with them on it, then maybe you won't get, hopefully, not maybe, but hopefully and praying that you won't get to that place we've been talking about earlier. So what are some of the things you can do? And Dr. Watson, chime in anytime here because this will be the you know, last few minutes of what we talk about. Uh, sure some parental strategies. First, you need to know the risks and know the signs and symptoms, as I mentioned. Family history is a, is a precursor for drug and alcohol use. What that means is if, that's, if you have drug or alcohol dependency or addiction in your family, you need to be aware of it. You need to know that what may be normal for another child or may work for another child may not work for your child. So they have to be, you know, they're bombarded on with TV, things like, you know, they have commercial with, you know, attractive young guys and girls on the beach and all having a great time and drinking beer. And, you know, you have to be able to tell your child that may look good, but in our family, that doesn't work. 
uh, if they have a mental behavioral disorder, anxiety, depression, ADD, ADHD, then they're gonna be predisposed uh, even more so for drug use. If there's a history of trauma in their life, uh, early childhood experiences uh, of traumatic kind, they're gonna be uh, set up to be more prone to using drugs. And if they have impulse control problems, uh, so A, know the risks. Some things to do, modeling, you know, your kids will hear what you say, but they're gonna do what they see you do. And so if you're home, if, if you have drug or alcohol problems, it's gonna be hard for you to uh, uh, convince your kids not to, to use. But more important, you know, if, if uh, alcohol, for example, becomes a major part of one's life, one's home life, kids see that. You know, it's real hard to say, don't drink. And then every time there's a celebration, alcohol becomes a big part of it. So modeling is important, setting limits. By the way, this last two minutes of this talk, this is a full hour talk on parental strategies that we give. So I'm just gonna run through them quickly. Maybe if you have some questions, be glad to answer them. But we have to teach our kids how to have delayed gratification. If they can do things now for a later payoff, they will develop much better. Drug and alcohol is the opposite. Drug and alcohol uses instant gratification. You take a drink, you, 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 you drop a pill, within a few minutes, you're gonna have the feeling you know you want. Open communication, probably the most important. And we need to really learn how to communicate and validate feelings as part of communication. Yeah, well, one of the say? things I just wanna just jump in and say, Dr. Gabriel, what, what the research shows, the parents are still the most uh, essential prevention entity. And one time, the one time that that happens is around the dinner table, around the, those times when you have an organic conversations that, that can happen. Anyway, just wanted to point that out. Uh, know how to pick your battles. I go into a whole talk about ABC issues. A is things that are non-negotiable. B are things that, uh, C are things that you don't like, but your child can pick. And B are things you negotiate over. If For those parents where everything becomes an A, in other words, going to school, not doing drugs, how you clean your room, how you comb your hair, all become uh, A, A type battles, then lots of kids will eventually just turn off and just ignore all of it. You have to know the difference between support and enabling uh, and know the difference between process versus end results. And, oops, I'm sorry, rituals. Not, those are not satanic rituals. Those are rituals that you do at home that are uh, uh, preventative, help prevent drug use. Things like having dinner a few times a week together as a family. Things like- That's very important, having, by the way. Yeah, having events that, you know, let's go see grandma every Tuesday, or let's go to the library on Thursday. So certain rituals in one's life gives a certain amount of structure. And then finally, back to communication is, you know, I, I always tell parents, talk so your kids will listen and listen so your kids will talk. And what that means is to uh, learn how to uh, listen to your children. You don't have to agree, but when they tell you how they feel, you have to learn how to validate their feelings and accept their reality and not just tell them what to do or what they should or shouldn't do. And, uh, and then hopefully the point is, hopefully they will listen. I mean, hopefully they will not obey listen, but hopefully they will hear you. And hopefully they, most important, they will talk to you. So communication is obviously the antidote to much and most of this. Uh, anything to add to that, Dr. Watson? Nope, I think that's, 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 that's it, that's good. So I'm going to stop sharing. And uh, move my cat over here. Uh, Dr. Lee, I'm not sure how we do Q and A in this webinar. If there is any, I don't, I don't see. Put, any put it in the chat box, or is that what it is? Yes, they can. They can use the chat box. Um, and now we're back to. I can't start my video, but um, there's anybody that has a question for Dr. Watson or Dr. Gilbert, please. Put in the chat. And put if you have questions. Well, actually, there's a Q and A box or the chat box. Either one. I'll monitor. There was a chat box. Yeah. If you uh, have any questions or want something explained a little bit more, please uh, do so in the chat box. Or Dr. Gilbert, do you mind making me host? So I can turn my camera on again. Yes, yeah, sure. Okay. I'll make you. Okay, okay. So once you're host, then I'm not. There we go. 
Oh, I'm sorry. Wrong person, I apologize. Oh, there is a question. Let's see. Does that work? Okay. Do do you have suggestions for delayed gratification techniques for elementary school age kids? I'm trying to get you to be on camera here. Hold on oh. one second. My host. Or Dr. Watson, maybe I'll, I'll while well, while we're figuring out the host. Um, do you have any suggestions for delayed gratification techniques for elementary school aged kids? Yeah, Dr. Gilbert. Yeah, I'll jump on that because. Uh, First of all, let me talk about it in case you haven't heard. You know, a long time ago, there was a classic study called the Marshmallow Test, a book written about it. And it sounds very simplistic, but the researchers gave the kids a choice to have, uh, I'll give you one marshmallow now, or if you wait, I'll go out of the room. And if you wait, five, 10, whatever it means, not very long. When I come back, I'll give you two marshmallows. And, in, and then they followed those kids for like 50 years. And interestingly, the ones who had the ability to wait, which is delayed gratification, uh, were uh, more successful, had less uh, body, body, fat, body mass index, had less drug use, had less depression, higher SAT scores. So there's, there's and, and that's not surprising when you think about it, because especially school, school is a, is a uh, delayed gratification organization to a large degree. At least it was when I went. Meaning, I'd say to my teacher, why am I learning algebra? Like, what does that have to do with me? And they'd say, they wouldn't say the right thing, but they're basically saying, you learn it now because there's going to be some payoff in the future. Uh, so anyway, that's the, so there is a benefit, I guess. That's not the question. The question is, what can you do to uh, uh, um, teach it? And that's the great thing about it is a teachable skill. So one thing, you know, if you have little kids, make them earn things a little bit more especially here in Palos Verdes, you know, where I live as well. And, you know, socioeconomically, we're a little, you know, well off and so on. You know, your child loses their bike because they left it out in the rain and they left it out and they didn't chain it up and they start crying and screaming. So you go get them a new bike. Well, maybe they need to earn that. Maybe they need to figure out a way to not just have what they want, but learn how to, how to earn it. Allowance, maybe allowance shouldn't be things like, I'll give you $5 a week or, you know, Shows my age or something. Maybe now it's twenty five. <laughs> five dollars is not going to get it. <laughs> I know I'm going to too much for a little bit of fentanyl. Uh, more, more like yeah. twenty five or hundred dollars. But, but five. But 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 allowance should be not just a free. You know, nobody gives us gives you gives you very much for free. So allowance should have uh, uh, a yes. a certain amount of chores that are you have to do before you even get the allowance, rather than just paying for those. So there are ways to begin teaching young kids, how to just not have everything at moment's notice. And the more you can do that, and the more you can show them the value. First of all, the more valuable whatever they're trying to gain becomes. And uh, they learn- It means more to them. Value. When you earn something, it means more to you. Any other questions? Uh, I don't see one, but I did want to actually share this book. Um, you you mentioned it in your yeah. talk. And it says how to talk so kids will listen and listen so kids will talk. Right. So there's this book. It's for teens and um, a lot of really good advice on how to communicate with your families or with your children at home. Um, yeah, and it's and very easy like, to read. There's comics and scenarios. So I so highly recommend this book. It's so important for this reason. You know, they did studies years ago, and and they asked kids, who would you most uh, who, who would you most like to talk to if you had problems? And the kids said, another adult, my parents, somebody like that. And they asked the kids, okay, well, who do you talk to when you have problems? That's right. And they all said they're friends. Right. And so here they are talking to somebody who has no more experience and no more knowledge for the most part than they have because they don't feel properly heard by their parents. And yet that's the person they really want to have whether it's their parents or another a teacher could be, but you know they 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 want an adult to guide them, and and who better to guide our teens than adults rather than another teen struggling with the same issues? Okay. I did want to mention that if folks have some questions that they just may not be comfortable uh, asking or or, or 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 talking about now, that uh, that hopefully they have the contact information uh, you know, for me and for for Dr. Gilbert. Yeah. And, you know, and, and the other thing that we have to say, since we, you know, we were talking about a really uh, frightening topic here. And uh, the, if you have concerns and you're not sure, 
you know, there's plenty of places in the community to reach out to, uh, including the Thelma McMillan Recovery Center, uh, where there's, you know, LaPar Torrance Memorial Hospital. And so our goal is to make sure that adults and kids who ever have issues or questions get the best care they need. But, you know, there's other places as well. There's lots of good treatment programs, lots of good psychiatrists and therapists who are specialists in substance use. So if you're not sure, uh, get some help, number one. And number two, here's another thing we always hear, and Dr. Watson will confirm this. You know, a parent will come in, they'll say, well, you know, my kid's not so bad. I mean, a teacher or a doctor will refer them to Phil McMillan. And a parent will come in and say, he's no different than everybody else, and he's really not so bad. And we say to them, again, tongue in cheek, well, you can take care of this now, but if you want to wait till it's really bad, then come back when it's really bad. Uh, and, you know, because the time to do something, especially for an outpatient program like we have, is we, we're in the early intervention. Inter intervention, yes. It's not prevention, but it's early intervention. So, again, important. I saw there was another question or something. No. Uh, the question was the title of the book and the author. So uh, I, I thought it was an easy read and something that I'm using as a parent. So, so. It, we, and we didn't even rehearse that. Dr. I know. Yeah, just kind of came organically. Just you just you should have copyrighted the, the phrase, but it's a great book. Um, all right. Well, I well, think we're good for today. Course. Thank you, Doctors Watson and uh, Dr. Yelbart, for today. And um, yeah, a lot, a lot of things to consider. And all right, any questions?